let's do a brief review of the atomic theory and what's going on to understand the properties of electricity. Now, we have this up here because it's a good thing to think about. Good pool players know what the reactions are going to be when they apply force to cue balls and have them hit other balls. We're going to talk about the same thing. Now, let's talk about atoms and electrons and get down to the basics very quickly. Neil Bortz discovered and, and publicized his model of the atom. What he did, he made a planetary model like our solar system, the sun and the, and the planets. This is the, the way he simplified the representation of the atom. In the center is a nucleus. It is made up of protons and neutrons. The protons attract electrons, and then the electrons are orbiting about the nucleus. Looks very much like you say, the orbits of the planets. Now, what's important about these electrons is not necessarily the shape, but how far they are located from the nucleus. The farther away they are, the lighter the attraction. And the fewer electrons in a particular orbit, the easier it is to knock them out of that orbit. An insulator will have all their orbits full, no room for extra electrons, held very tightly. Conductors will have only a few, ideally only one electron in the outer orbit, located far away from the nucleus. People talk about ions, and you think, wow, what's an ion? That's going to be something really high-tech. It's not high-tech. An ion is simply, if we take one of these electrons and strip it away from this uh, atom with a strong electrical attraction, it'll make this a positive ion, meaning there's more positives in this atom than there are negatives. It will be searching for another electron to fill that void, to fill that hole, if you would. That's what an ion is. If we have a, other things we can force the ele electrons into, like a combination of atoms and a molecule, we can force an extra electron in there. It becomes a negative ion. So don't get con concerned about all these ions. They're simply things that are have extra or missing electrons. Now let's talk about the ones at the bottom. We've got a lot of things in our periodic chart. And they all go by their atomic weights up here. Let's look at copper down at the bottom. On the outermost orbit, we have only one electron. And it's far away from the 29 protons down in the nucleus. That's very easy to strip that electron away and pull it away with a strong positive charge or repel it with a strong negative charge or in reality, apply a negative to one side and a positive to the other and pull it right through. Look at silver to the right of it. We also have only one electron, but it's located far, far away from the nucleus, much further away from the nucleus than copper. We'll tell you what that's going to result in. Then if you look at zinc, our outermost orbit has only two electrons. It's an okay conductor. Not great, but okay. Carbon, on the other hand, has got four. Now, in that particular orbit, it takes eight to fill it up, so it's uh, half full. It's a mm, mediocre conductor. Not great, not bad. Is it any surprise we use carbon to make a resistive compound to form a resistor? So this atomic theory stuff isn't empty. It has some meaning to it. Let's take it a little further. Let's talk about an insulator. When an atom is a good insulator, like wood, rubber, glass, paper, Teflon, a polyvinyl chloride material, the electrons are stuck in their shells, and they won't come out for nothing. Now, we say nothing, but in reality, you have enough voltage, you can break down an insulator. We can form carbon paths through an insulator, which will greatly reduce its resistance. Oh, that old word carbon comes back up again. Electrical insulation is exactly the opposite of a conductor or a conduction. We need this to isolate our wiring and our power sources so we can route the electricity around the circuits and take them to the devices to power them up. Conductors are excellent sources, like copper and other metals. They're electrons that are easy to pop out like we were looking at. Silver is the best. It's one electron is located far away from the nucleus. Now, most people think gold is the best conductor. But the real strength of gold is it doesn't oxidize or corrode 
like other materials. Silver tarnishes, copper tarnishes, but gold always stays shiny. That's why it's used in electrical connectors. Not necessarily gold wiring, but electrical connectors because it doesn't corrode, doesn't oxidize, and be truthful. Anytime we talk about electronics and say positive and negative, we need to add the word charge. This is the fundamental property of charges. Like charges repel each other. Unlike charges or opposite charges attract each other. When we have a free electron out there, if we put these charges on it, we can push it away and pull it away according to what polarity we're using. We're going to be utilizing that. Sounds like theory? I know. There's a, but there's some needs for this material. We're going to be telling you how we're going to use it. There's a field about all these charges called an electrostatic field. This field creates static cling. It creates lightning bolts, stuff you can It is the field that exerts the force of our own other charges, either to repel them or to attract them. It's what we build into our system. Now, we can take two charges here, put on each side of this green ball. We've got a bunch of missing electrons on the left. We've got excess electrons on the right. We need a way for them to exchange their location. There's no place for them to go. To make this work, we make a circuit, and what will happen is we'll send excess electrons around to the other side. We call this a hypothetical electron pump. But our electron pump is just the battery. With a battery, if we add a lamp, we can take the positive excess positives on the left and the excess electrons on the right. Now, remember, excess positive means you don't have enough electrons. They must be positive ions. Oh, and on the right, we must have negative ions trying to shed off and get rid of electrons. Right. That's where the ions come in. They live inside the battery. Like charges repel, opposites attract. So the electrons are being pushed through the lamp where they heat up the film and make it glow. The movement of these electrons is called current flow. Current flow is the result of an applied force. Now, anytime we have current flow, we're also going to have magnetism present. When charges move through a conductor, there's an invisible electromagnetic field created around that conductor. The field is important because we're going to use it later on and talk about using it to make measurements. When we look at this, we have the right-hand rule of magnetic fields. If we point our thumb of our right hand toward the direction of current flow, the fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field. We're going to use this. In fact, all of you have already used this principle right here. You've all taken your battery tester, hooked your inductive clamp around the wiring, and measured current flow in the wiring without breaking the circuit. You call that an inductive pickup, a Hall effect pickup, an amps pickup. In reality, what it's doing, it's measuring the magnetic field. This magnetic field is in proportion to the current flowing through the wiring. The stronger the field, the higher the current. So you see, all this theory comes back to testing automobiles. Let's look at some other things and go just a little bit deeper into this.